and a lot of science. But it seemed to me there had to be an answer and that there needed to be an answer. It all started 16 years ago with a highly unusual request from a contact in South America. A priest in Argentina had reported what appeared to be a miraculous event, a communion wafer or host that had mysteriously turned to flesh and blood. As an independent journalist, I was asked to assist in this strange case. This mystifying event sent shockwaves all the way to the very top of the Catholic Church, to the man who would become Pope. Nothing could have prepared me for what was to follow. Pope Francis was well known here as Cardinal Bergoglio, Archbishop of Buenos Aires. Put simply, he was the Catholic leader in this city. And when he heard that a communion host was said to have bled in one of his churches, he asked for a scientific investigation. And so I began my investigation into what became known as the miracle of Santa Maria. Could this really be living proof of Jesus Christ? Or is it just an elaborate hoax? iba a ser entregado a su pasión, aceptada libremente. This is the consecration which turns bread and wine into the flesh and blood of Christ. That is what the Catholic Church teaches. The communion wafers, also known as hosts, are made simply from flour and water. They swallow the hosts in the belief it will lead them to eternal life in heaven. To believe that bread can become the flesh and blood of Christ, not symbolically but real, requires faith, great faith. The miracle of Santa Maria happened in 1996. During a communion service, Padre Alejandro handed out the hosts as normal. One per person, every host must be consumed. It's sacred. But during the Mass that day, there was one sacred host that was not swallowed. Instead, it was discarded, left in a candlestick holder. Normally, he would consume a lost host, but because it was dirty, it was placed in a bowl of water and the bowl was locked in the tabernacle. It would dissolve. It dissolved. That's and what should happen. <laughs> Emma Fernandez, the priest's assistant, returned a week later to dispose of the unwanted host. I pulled out the container with the host and I noticed that the host was red. It looked like blood. She was shocked and hurried to Padre Alejandro to give him the news. The unexpected transformation was, quite simply, a shock. What happened then? So I looked, and the host was red. The question was, could this be a miracle? Could this be the blood of Jesus Christ? What was your reaction then? I didn't know what to think about that. But I felt it was something strange and supernatural. You thought it was supernatural? I thought that it was possible that it was supernatural. Fue impresionante. You took those photographs, did you? Yes. yes. Professional photographer Marcello Antonini was called in to document the case. This is what he saw a bright red substance which looked like blood. There was no evidence of the original wafer. For Marcello, a non-believer, this experience changed his life.
When you took these pictures, your strongest memory from all this? Uh, You're clearly still very emotional. Yes, yes. <laughs> this inexplicable event had now been documented, but the church wanted irrefutable scientific proof. Was it really a miracle or was it a hoax? And this is when I was called in to take part in the search which Archbishop Borgoglio, now Pope Francis, wanted. I started the testing in a laboratory in Northern California. Uh, as you can see, these white cells, this is, oh, here's an epidermal cell. The first result was the first surprise. Definitely from skin. So you found skin? Forensic pathologist Dr. Robert Lawrence is not religious. He does not believe in God. There was this keratonic debris and the inflammatory cells that came from some living organism, yeah. some living, not from a cookie. The first reported case of a bleeding host goes back 1,200 years to Lanciano, Italy. Since then, the church has declared communion hosts to be miraculous well over 100 times. <laughs> Professor Eduardo Linoli led the first ever scientific investigation into these inexplicable occurrences. He found human heart tissue, myocardium, in the 1,200-year-old relic from Lanciano. I treated the flesh and found out that it was myocardium. I also found arteries and vein typicals of the inner part of the heart. So it was hard for sure. A baffled Professor Linoli presented his results to the church. He was convinced this was tissue that had come from the heart of Jesus Christ. They were elated with his findings and declared the Lanciano case a miracle. My Buenos Aires case was strikingly similar and no less puzzling. So I sought the help of the professor. This is definitely tissue. Can't say for sure from the picture. But this could be her heart. You see, this is the tissue. These are the cells. They could be blood cells. I have one scientist, Dr. Lawrence, telling me it could be skin, and another scientist, Professor Linoli, told me it could be heart. Both do believe it's human. My quest to prove beyond doubt the origin of this mysterious genetic material next takes me to New York. This is this book, Diagnostic Histochemistry, that I wrote. To seek the opinion of eminent forensic pathologist and heart expert, Dr. Frederick Zugaby, I had to test Professor Linoli's finding that this could be heart tissue. OK, now I can see your little dots in here. Because Dr. Zugaby is Catholic, I didn't reveal the origins of the sample he examined. This was a blind test. Dr. Zugaby soon identifies the possible source of the sample. I think it actually comes from about, uh, about right in this area, right in here. And what's the function of that part of the heart? That's a left ventricle, that's a major uh, area that pumps the blood to all parts of the body. That is fantastic. We've now established it could be human heart tissue. Which, coming from a piece of bread, is remarkable. Now it's time to return to Argentina to give Padre Alejandro, the priest at the center of this mystery, our puzzling news. Hi, 
Good to see you. Let's just go through the science from Santa Maria. The scientists tell us there were living white cells. They also said that was impossible. What does that mean to you? Jesus is alive <laughs> and he wanted to, to give us a sign to, to grow our, our faith. And he wants to, us to, to know and to believe that he suffered for each one. My journey to find answers to some of the most puzzling religious happenings now takes me to a place of great faith and great violence. I'm on my way to Tixla in the state of Guerrero in Mexico. I'm accompanied by the local militia in case our visit attracts the attention of the feared Unidos drug cartel. This is one of the most dangerous places in the world, but coming here gives us a greater chance of finding an answer. An answer to what has become known as the miracle of Mexico. Inside this church, mounted high on the wall, behind bulletproof glass, is the bloodstained communion host. It has the faithful flocking and giving to the church. But this holy relic Gracias, Padre. has also brought the unwanted attention of the Mexican drug cartels. Just two days ago, the Padre was threatened with his life. Posturas de silencio. I should remain silent. De gente que está... The day before yesterday, I got a call from bad people who were threatening me for money. El trabajo. They told me I had to keep quiet, and they demanded to know if I had a bank account. Vehículos. Padre, did you pay them money? Sí. Padre, you are afraid. Precaución. Yes, because we now live in fear. They have reached my weakness, and I don't want to show it in public. No quiero que vaya el público. The frightened padre is certain the miracle host is responsible for the threat to his church, but he believes he must protect the bloody host, which appeared here in Mexico in front of hundreds of witnesses. La comunión. The horse was given to a lady in a wheelchair, but he fell back, back into the bowl. That is when I was noticed to be stained with blood. And how many people saw this? In the church that day, there were 800 people that lived that moment. Padre, I know this is a difficult question for you, but if you could give us a a tiny sample to compare with the others around the world, I think we can take a big step forward. Yes, of course. I will let you take it. Thank you, Padre. As we collect tiny scrapings of the bloody host, it's crucial we don't contaminate the sample with our own DNA. I will take this tiny speck back to Melbourne for forensic analysis. But before I go, there is another case to be investigated in Colombia. All the strange religious events I've investigated to date have been celebrated by the faithful, and the church has been keen to declare some of them miracles. But in Colombia, my next encounter with the supernatural was very different. Here, the local bishop went to extraordinary lengths to cover it up. Just before Easter in 2006, there was another event, just like Argentina, just like Mexico. But it happened here, in this tiny, dusty town in central Colombia, another bleeding host. During the preparations, 
and none was carrying a large, consecrated host to the church. It was in a metal container, rather like this. When she opened it, she was stunned. The host, made simply of flour and water, appeared to be bleeding. Al otro día, el miércoles, it was like fresh blood. It was something inexplicable. What did you think? We had our doubts. How did it happen? And who did this? This case was to become the silent case. The nuns were told not to talk about it. They could not have anticipated the shock that was to come, nor the ferocity with which it would be delivered. Inexplicably, the local bishop, Father Ortiz, was fiercely sceptical. So much so, Sister Layla feared he would destroy the host before it could be tested. Oh, yes. Look at this under here. Here. This is what they believe is the blood of Jesus Christ. Take this sample here. I think that's the best one. With this sample, uh, I'd be reasonably confident that we have enough and we have a pathologist look at it. And uh, the first thing we'd be looking for is any uh, human tissue. But of course, we'd be looking for anything that the scientists can, can show us. This is the sample you will take. It was fortunate that I got there when I did. Soon after, the bishop went to the church, seized the host, destroyed it, and then buried it in the garden. The bishop was afraid of the controversy it would bring to the church. Padre, were you shocked? Yes, of course. Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. The church has always assumed this is true and they have always defended it. So this is extraordinary. I too was perplexed by the bishop's unwillingness to investigate the so-called miracle. I called him seeking an explanation, but he refused to respond to my calls. 30 kilometers from the Tin Shed Church, and no one in the nearby city of Naiva knows anything about the bleeding host, and that's exactly how the local bishop wants it. Padre, we will continue our scientific research. That is wonderful news, excellent. The bishop can take it from you, he can't take it from me. For the past 20 years, I've been investigating the truth behind a series of confounding spiritual happenings around the world. My search for answers has now brought me here to Cochabamba, Bolivia, to a strange phenomenon that made world news. I was told of a statue of Christ that shed tears and blood. Despite my personal and professional scepticism, I came here to see if this could somehow be happening. I saw a statue of Christ with a face partially covered with what appeared to be dried blood. But as for tears and bleeding, I saw what I expected to see, which was nothing. But the locals had seen otherwise, and they claimed it truly was a miracle. At around 11 a.m. on the 9th of March 1995, Sylvia Arabello brought a cheap plaster statue of Jesus Christ. I saw this statue, and it's the one that I liked, and I thought it was very pretty. At 7 p.m. that day, Sylvia invited her family to pray in front of the new statue. Sylvia's daughter, Kim, was 17 at the time. And we were witnesses of how that statue started weeping for the first time. Tears. Tears. Tears from his eyes. Did you see that? I did see that. What was your reaction? 
My reaction was, I was in between excited, scared. My heart started beating very fast. I started sweating. I didn't know if I should laugh, if it was a good sign, if it was a bad sign. All I knew was I found myself on my knees and started crying myself. The tears from the statue continued to flow. Here, 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 look at, look at that. During the next 48 hours, the statue also began to seep what looked like blood. The first time I saw the statue bleed, that's when I truly felt very scared. I felt like God was warning us about something and I didn't know what it was. The Catholic Church says a miracle must be extraordinary, it must be visible to the senses, and it must be proof that God exists in the natural world. And so began the exhaustive quest to prove if this was a miracle or a fraud. Meantime, the faithful and the curious flocked to see the weeping statue. If you ask me how many times he cried tears, for the first year back in 1995, he cried almost every day, but not only once a day. He cried many times a day. So let's make that approximately 300 times. 20 years has passed by, and I would say that the Christ cried about 800 to 1,000 times. When you say cried, are you, are you counting blood also? Yes. So it's tears and blood. Tears and blood. But had the statue been tampered with? And what was the red blood-like substance oozing from within? To find out, we are taking the statue to undergo the latest in three-dimensional scanning. Every crack, inside and out, will be clear to see. Now you've seen it go through this incredible machine and scanned thoroughly. What can you tell us? This is the second time we uh, do this uh, scanning to this image. The first time was 20 years ago. And the result is the same. We don't see anything we are sure that we don't have any, any trick here. So there's nothing inside the statue that could produce any liquid on the outside? Any liquid, no. There's nothing, a pure image. <laughs> Just a pure image? <laughs> yeah. Nothing else? Nothing else. This high-tech scan proves the statue has not been tampered with. So what are the liquids coming from the statue and where do they come from? First sample is tested by some of the world's leading molecular biologists. The presumptive test for the presence of blood was positive for both of your samples. Now, then we did a human-specific quantitative test for DNA. So to see how much human DNA we have in the sample, and that was negative. myself I've been right there in a theater and watched an elephant disappear and I know that that didn't really happen so uh, I uh, that would be my thought that this was a uh, a deception of some kind for 20 years almost a quarter of my life I've been searching for the truth behind a series of so-called miracles or supernatural events 
leading host of Buenos Aires, Bolivia's weeping statue of Cochabamba, the mysterious bloody host of Campo Alegre, Colombia, and the miracle of Mexico. Could these really be physical proof of Jesus Christ? Or are they clever acts of deception designed to fool the masses? When I first began this quest, blood and DNA fingerprinting was new technology. But now, two decades on, the latest forensic DNA analysis is so advanced, a single human cell can be tested and its origin revealed. It all comes down to this, using microscopic samples to answer the biggest question of all. There it is a dark fleck of material and about one millimeter in greatest dimension. I don't believe in God, but then again, it would be exciting and wonderful to me if this turned out to prove the existence of God. I mean, I think that would be great. I would love to be proved wrong. Unfortunately, everyone wants proof just from lab. Laboratory is what it works. Scientists is what it works. Doctors is what it works. But it doesn't work just being a miracle from God, a sign from God. That doesn't work. So that's what they're expecting. They're expecting on man's word and not on God's word. The world's leading laboratory for single cell analysis is in Bologna, Italy. Their groundbreaking technology is known as the Depuray process, designed for cutting edge cancer research and complicated forensic crime scene investigations. The cell type uh, identification and isolation is very important because uh, uh, the analysis can provide 100% pure genetic results. To get those pure genetic results, Dr. Francesca Fontana and her team analyzed each of our samples. It was a great challenge for us, but uh, we succeeded in identifying the type of cells which were present. We were really surprised to obtain uh, so much data out of the, those uh, samples. In the samples from all three, human white blood cells and human tissue cells were identified. But here's the mystifying twist. Despite the large amount of DNA information available, further testing was unable to identify who the cells came from. One reason given is that these samples had become degraded. Another is that somehow this result was beyond the knowledge of science. The clearest interpretation of any of the cases came from the tiny fragment of the so-called Miracle of Mexico. We brought it back to Australia to be tested at the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine. And like the other samples, it was identified as human, but in this case, there was more information. What can you tell us about our samples? For the ones that we've been able to get a nuclear DNA profile, that they are female in origin, so the samples have come from a female donor. Our investigation has found the blood is human and it's from a woman. So it's not the result of a divine event and even suggests there may have been a well-orchestrated fraud. So whose blood is it? Without testing the DNA of every woman who's had access to the host, it's impossible to tell. This Mexican event is now commonly described as a miracle and the church has declared it a divine sign. But it seems to have failed the scientific test. But try telling that to the believers. I began this investigation as a skeptic and the results from the Mexico case tend to make some of those doubts a little stronger. But the inability of 20 years of scientific research seeking clear answers to the other so-called miracles underlines the depth 
this mystery, which means to me this case is not closed.